Tonight, a long-awaited apology for a dark practice in this country. This was an experiment that was invasive and an experiment in radical social engineering. Indigenous people forced to work for the government. Tonight, the generations of work that brought about this moment. People have been fighting to have this history recognized. Ontario's premier faces fury over the health care crunch. 90% of the patients are getting taken care of when they're going in the hospital. Nine out of 10 is not what I strive for. God forbid that one out of 10 was my loved one. And how much would you pay to see the boss? Why Ticketmaster can charge as much as 5,000 bucks for a concert ticket. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Janella Massa. Adrian is away. We begin tonight with a hard lesson in Canada's history that you probably weren't taught in school, but now it's more relevant than ever. It started more than 100 years ago. Residential school survivors in Saskatchewan forced to do farm labour in what's been called a government experiment to assimilate Indigenous people. Today, an official apology delivered in a language those schools and that farm tried hard to destroy. It comes as so many here are doing the work of reconciliation. The Pope's visit last week, shining light on the lasting pain and making it all the more urgent. Cameron McIntosh shows us the apology and the hard work by Indigenous people that brought about this moment. Papikasis Cree Nation sits near some of Saskatchewan's best farmland. Land the federal government took control of more than a century ago. Now, in their community, and in their traditional language. Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller saying the words people here have long waited to hear. I'm here on behalf of the Government of Canada to formally apologize to Papikis Cree Nation and to all community members for the File Hill Colony Scheme. The File Hills Colony was established in 1898 using residential school survivors to farm here under the control of the federal government an experiment in assimilation that harmed the people forced to take part. They didn't have the right to leave or associate with others. Some were even placed in arranged marriages. This was an experiment that was invasive in nature and an experiment in radical social engineering. When it shut down in the 40s, most of the land was taken. The community split into factions. Impacts still felt generations later. Papixi's membership continues to face social ills such as drug and alcohol addictions, violence and suicides that are a result of band division. Debbie Hill's grandparents lived under those harsh rules. They were not allowed to feed their own children the food that they grew. People have been fighting to have this history recognized. Band member Cheyenne Desnomi has done extensive academic research on the colony, calls it one of the least known stories of the residential school era. We're putting that story out there, and this is how we can move forward and we can heal, again, not just as a community, but as a nation. The apology follows a $150 million settlement last year. Money, the chief says, will be used to build up the community. The most important of these issues is to reclaim our Cree identity. That will include buying some of that land back. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, today the Pope used his weekly general audience at the Vatican to reflect on what he learned during his trip to Canada. It was unlike other journeys. In fact, Pope Francis said he felt the pain of Indigenous people who described to him all they had lost due to policies of assimilation that tore their families apart. He once again asked for forgiveness. In Ontario, doctors and nurses are sounding the alarm tonight amid growing concerns about access to health care. It comes as staffing shortages are forcing some ER closures. It's a terrifying thought for the people who rely on them. Today, after weeks out of the spotlight, Ontario's premier stepped in front of the cameras to address it. His message, we're working on it, but right now Ontarians are getting the care they need. As Chris Reyes shows us, that messaging getting pushback from the front lines. At a meeting with auto workers, Premier Doug Ford was peppered with questions about hospital care in his province amid stories of closures, overworked staff and delays. Make no mistake about it, uh, there, there, there's a logjam. But 90% of the patients 
are getting taken care of when they're going in the hospital. But those on the front line say that number isn't acceptable. Nine out of 10 is not what I strive for. I strive for 10 out of 10, and God forbid that one out of 10 was my loved one. One, two, three. And that it doesn't account for a crucial chunk of time. It is routine to be waiting between an hour and two hours for patients to actually get from registration to triage. Ford admitted the province needs more nurses, touting a plan to hire some trained internationally and a bonus to keep some from leaving. We gave the nurses across the province a well-deserved $5,000 retention bonus. Personally, I would rather have staffing. I would rather have you know, the ability to be there for my patients, the ability to take my own breaks. A survey from the Registered Practical Nurses Association of Ontario found nearly half of those questioned are considering leaving the profession. We work in a system today that wouldn't even be able to, to tolerate a thousand leaving. But when you think of half of 55,000, we can see the devastation. Uh, that would take place across the system. The GTA. Jean Dench's partner had a stroke two weeks ago, and waiting hours for an ambulance, her experience highlights delays across the system. People are really running ragged as far as the just trying to give basic care, and it's not, it wasn't even bathed for almost two weeks. Dench challenges Ford to spend a day in a hospital to see the situation for himself. They're getting the blood pressure taken, they're getting the other tests done, but there's no time for any humanity. Something patients and healthcare workers are echoing across the province. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Toronto. The Conservative Party of Canada held its third leadership debate, the last chance candidates have to face each other before the party chooses who will lead them into the next federal election. But as Ashley Burke explains, there was a wrinkle. Only three of the five candidates showed up. I win, Mr. Podiev loses. That's the choice the, the how, party how has. Jean Charest wanted a third debate, and he got it, but without his biggest opponent, and used that to take a swipe at Pierre Polyev for not showing up. Members don't deserve to be treated with contempt. As the debate got underway, a more pointed attack online. Charest posting a fake live feed of this empty podium with Polyev nowhere to be seen. For a candidate in a leadership race not to participate in the debate is like a fish who says he doesn't want to swim in the ocean. Thank you, Saskatchewan. Both Polyev and fellow candidate Leslin Lewis both skipped the third official debate to attend other events in other provinces. Instead of being here with all of you in Saskatchewan, I could have been cooped up in a little hotel room around a small table, listening to a defeated Liberal Premier drone on about his latest carbon tax idea. Lewis making her pitch on PEI. That's why we need a parental rights bill. Both are expected to be fined $50,000 for skipping the official debate. Strategy shouldn't be an excuse for not showing up. Uh, not taking a risk is not really that acceptable. It's a bit arrogant. Unlike the past debates, this one a roundtable conversation in both English and French. They all took jabs against the Liberal government, but were civil toward each other. I propose that we allow for more competition, and that includes competition in airlines. We do need more competition. Charest used the debate to continue to try and position himself as the only candidate who could win the next general election. Getting our country, our party organized and united. I will do that. I know how to do it. It's what I've done all my life. Bookending his remarks with a final dig. If we are going to unite the party, you have to show up. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. And CBC's Catherine Cullen is following the Conservative leadership race closely. Catherine, given tonight's debate and the no-shows, where do things stand with this race right now? Well, Janelle, you know, that, that didn't feel like a game changer, did it? It honestly was a pretty polite conversation between three people who don't seem to particularly like the government. The Conservative Party's stated goal here was to help party members make up their minds with 
Two, though, of the big names opting out of this debate, it's not easy for members to make that full comparison based on what they saw tonight. There's also the question of the timing of this debate. About 150,000 of the mail-in ballots have already been returned. That number, it's roughly half of what we might expect voter turnout to be. So a significant chunk of this race, it's already decided well before tonight's debate. And even though the presumed frontrunner Pierre Polyev wasn't actually at the debate, he does have some wind in his sails right now with fundraising numbers that came out yesterday showing he's raised more money than all the other candidates combined. And just as an individual raising significantly more than the Liberal Party as a whole in the second quarter of this year. Now, much of the discussion in conservative circles right now, really, it's not about whether Pierre Polyev is likely to win this race, but whether, rather whether he can do it on the first round of voting. Janella? All right. CBC's Catherine Cullen in Ottawa tonight. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie met with her German counterpart in Montreal today, framing Canada's controversial decision to waive sanctions and allow the export of a gas turbine for a Russian pipeline as standing up to Vladimir Putin. He tried to split us. He tried to play games with us. We called his bluff. It is now clear that Putin is weaponizing energy flows to Europe. Moscow initially cited the turbine as necessary to restore gas flows to Europe, but they remain at 20% of their normal levels. The turbine is now in Germany after Russia's state gas company refused to accept it. At the time, Ukraine said Canada's decision to release the turbine would be seen as a sign of weakness. The first shipment of Ukrainian grain since the start of the Russian invasion is now heading to its destination in Lebanon. The Rosoni is carrying 26,000 tons of corn. Its journey made possible by a deal with Russia for a safe shipping corridor. Of more than 25,000 cases around the world and nearly 900 in Canada, demand for the monkeypox vaccine is growing. And in some places, the supply isn't keeping up. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson reports, it's leading people to Canada. Whether they're in town for the Pride Week or the International AIDS Conference, the must have souvenir for many foreign visitors to Montreal is a monkeypox vaccine. Actually, it's still warm to the touch. This man got his shot and spread the word. When I met activists, especially from Sub Saharan Africa, I really encouraged them to take advantage of the fact that. Uh, Montreal was offering, well, Canada is offering um, the vaccine for free. Encouraging visitors to get the shot is not just an act of kindness for Montreal Public Health. Our goal is to protect the community from this disease and our communities are very much uh, interconnected. It's not just happening in Montreal. Frustrated by their own country's low vaccine supply or poor organization of clinics, Americans have been driving across the border to get the protection they need. Like this man from Seattle who drove to Surrey, B.C. I think just comparing the two, it was night and day between British Columbia and Washington State. Or this brand new Toronto resident who just moved from Minnesota. From what I've heard from my friends and community, it's like really hard to get vaccinated. So will this act of vaccine generosity leave enough for Canadians who still need it? It's hard to say. The Public Health Agency of Canada won't say how many vaccines are left in the national stockpile. Quebec Public Health, though, called foreigners getting monkeypox vaccines here a marginal phenomenon. But some experts urge caution, pointing out that for optimal protection from monkeypox, two shots are likely to be needed. And we may run into a situation where we'll have a limited amount of supply to do the second dose, and I think we have to be cautious about that. As the complex politics of vaccine supply once again pit the needs to protect many with the need to protect one's own. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And coming up, I speak with a doctor in Toronto to answer your questions about monkeypox and the vaccine. That's in about 15 minutes' time. On the U.S., House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has now left Taiwan after a visit that has angered China. It's really clear that while China has stood in the way of Taiwan participating and going to certain meetings, that they understand that they will not stand in the way of people coming to Taiwan. 
Pelosi is leading a congressional delegation on a tour of Asia. She says this stop is a show of support for Taiwan. China claims the territory as its own, something Taiwan rejects. Chinese state television showed video of the military exercises China launched around the island in response to Pelosi's visit. And in the U.S., people in Kansas voted to protect state abortion rights in a resounding decision, a surprise to many from the traditionally conservative state. But as Katie Simpson explains, it may have come down to the messaging. The reaction was so strong because the results were so unexpected. We did it. We did it. We did it. Voters in one of the most conservative states in the country clearly chose to uphold the abortion protections they have. I'm super proud to be from Kansas tonight, and I feel like my state just showed up and boldly told me that they are going to take care of me. By nearly a 60 to 40 margin, Kansans told lawmakers, no, they cannot remove the right to abortion from the state constitution. Turnout was just below 50 percent, which is considered high for a midsummer ballot. Anti-abortion advocates say it's now time to regroup. I think it might be a while before we get another bite at the apple. My body, my choice. This was the first vote of its kind since the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade, giving power to state governments to determine abortion access. Say no to more government control. The pro-choice side prevailed in part by running ads framing this as a rights issue, borrowing language from opponents of COVID lockdowns. It's a strict government mandate. Democrats hope this is a preview of how abortion could potentially motivate voters ahead of the midterms. There is intensity on the Democratic side on this issue. It's it created a lot of energy and frankly, it's spiking turnout on their side. And my administration has their back. Looking to build on the momentum, the president met virtually with his abortion rights task force afterwards, signing an executive order that will help patients travel out of state for care and provide legal guidance for doctors navigating new abortion laws. Voters made it clear that politicians should not interfere with the fundamental rights of women. Republican strategists are worried this could hurt their candidates, but they're instead focusing on inflation, betting that will be an even bigger voter motivator. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, back here at home, after months of delays and long lines, there's hope some new tech could speed things up at Canada's busiest airport. International travelers arriving at Toronto's Pearson Airport can now use these electronic gates. They're a quicker way for people 16 and older to submit customs and immigration details. The airport is hoping to add more within the year. One of Canada's biggest housing markets, Red Hot Vancouver, seems to be cooling. Almost 2,000 homes were sold in the region in July. That's down 43% from last year. As Susanna De Silva shows us, while sales are slowing, prices are still sky high and they're keeping people locked out. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of uh, million dollar price tags. It's always nice to dream, but cold, hard reality comes crashing down in one of Canada's priciest housing markets fast. How to describe real estate to people that don't live here? <laughs> I mean, just beyond expensive. I can't even imagine buying a place here. That's the common conversation for a lot of 20-year-olds. They're saying they want to move to Calgary. The Lower Mainland is seeing what is being described as a buyer's market, with sales dropping significantly. There, it is more of a buyer's market, certainly, than it was last year, when it, there was 10 offers on every property, practically. Now there's one offer, or maybe there's no offers. So it's a, it is a better time for buyers. They're way less stressed out. So while there's less competition, Prices in Metro Vancouver have only inched down, a 2.3% drop since last month, but compared to last year, they're still up more than 10%, with the average price of a detached home now at $2 million. And the long-term picture, even bleaker for buyers. Prices have increased almost 36% in just the last three years. Now you're down a tiny bit, but it's in a world with much higher mortgage interest rates. So the cost of owning a home for most people, especially first-time buyers, has really continued to explode uh, over the last few years. 
The multi-million dollar question is where is the market going? I think it's a time of tremendous uncertainty and with that uncertainty, it's not surprising that both buyers and sellers uh, don't seem to be in any rush to get into transactions. It's a buyer's market in the, in the way that they can offer a little bit less now, but doesn't really mean that it's in their favor still. So Peter Stryling owns a condo, but he'd like more space. You kind of have to keep your eye on it if you really want to get in at the right times. The question, as always, is what is the right time? Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. If you're looking for concert tickets this summer, some have shot up, way up. We could pretend that people aren't paying $5,000 to go to Springsteen if we like, but they were anyway. Coming up, Ticketmaster imposes surge pricing on popular concerts, but is it fair? Um, it's 100% it's, it's real. A notorious American conspiracy theorist changes his tune as he faces a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And a prominent Canadian civil rights lawyer who took on institutions across this country has passed. You don't just walk in, in the middle of the night with these search warrants rounding up people. We're back in two. Welcome back. Fans of the boss, Bruce Springsteen, were stunned by sky-high prices when they tried to get tickets for his upcoming tour. That's because Ticketmaster uses a controversial method that raises prices when demand is high. Thomas Daglin now on the strategy and the complaints. Having made a fortune as a working-class music icon, Bruce Springsteen suddenly has some lifelong fans vowing, I'll never give this man another dollar, and others tweeting, hashtag corporate greed. It is a hard pill to swallow when it's guy like Springsteen. When tickets went on sale for Springsteen's highly anticipated tour with the E Street Band, fans were shocked to see prices as high as $5,500 U.S. Consider some tickets to Elton John's upcoming Toronto show are going for nearly $2,500 with premium seats for the weekend in Vancouver on sale for even more. We are seeing these large companies that have next to no competition that are sort of able to charge whatever they want. At the heart of the controversy, the entertainment behemoth Ticketmaster and its near monopoly on sales for big shows and sports. The company allows marked up resales but also uses so-called dynamic pricing with some tickets automatically going up when demand is high. This business consultant says Ticketmaster's strategy ensures more money goes to artists instead of resellers. We could pretend that people aren't paying $5,000 to go to Springsteen if we like, but they were anyway. It's just a matter of who gets it. But now as fans again flock to shows, prices have surged, with one recent report suggesting hot tickets across North America have risen in price nearly 20% since 2019. I don't think... That's an easy one to solve, especially if an artist can only perform in that city for one night. Ticketmaster didn't respond to our questions and hasn't explained how it sets prices. Springsteen is still selling out concerts with enough fans willing to pay a premium. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A U.S. conspiracy theorist who spent years claiming the horrific mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary was staged has recanted. I think Sandy Hook happened. And I think it's a terrible event, especially since I've met the parents. And uh, it's 100% it's, it's real. Alex Jones' admission coming during a civil trial to determine how much he and his media company owe the parents of Sandy Hook victims. In a dramatic twist, Jones was confronted with another apparent falsehood. You've got the messages right there. You know what perjury is, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. I told you I gave, in my testimony, the phone to the lawyers before or whatever, and, and so you got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. In an apparently accidental disclosure, Jones's lawyers provided plaintiffs with two years worth of his phone text messages on Sandy Hook after he had testified under oath that he couldn't find any. Well, here at home, we asked members of Toronto's LGBTQ community what they want to know about monkeypox. 
I would like to know the effectiveness of the monkeypox vaccination. We'll have the answers from an infectious diseases doctor next. Welcome back. As the number of monkeypox cases grows in Canada, so too does concern and among one of the one group of people in particular. In this country, as globally, most confirmed cases are among men who have sex with other men. Earlier today, we asked members of Toronto's LGBTQ community what they want to know, and we took their questions to infectious diseases physician Dr. Kevin Woodward. So, Doctor, we went out into the community and we got people to ask some questions that they have about monkeypox and I'll play you some of them. Here's the first one. Would you recommend taking the monkeypox vaccine to avoid catching it? So definitely if you're a part of the community who's at risk for monkeypox, you should go out and get the vaccine. We know that when people get the vaccine that they have relatively few side effects afterwards. So it's been safe in the studies that have looked at it. And certainly for someone, it's much better than getting monkeypox. And if you're not in the community, should you get one? So I think right now, the recommendation is for people who are within the, the queer community or the LGBT community who are at risk for monkeypox, those are the ones who should go out and get the vaccine. We're not seeing a large number of cases in the community at large right now. That can change. But for right now, my advice would be if you're part of one of the affected communities, go out and get the vaccine. Okay, here's the next question. I would like to know the effectiveness of the monkeypox vaccination and um, how long does it last? And do they expect for people to get another vaccination um, after the initial one, like the COVID vaccination? So these are really good questions, and that's because the, the vaccine that we're using for monkeypox was actually developed for smallpox. And that vaccine's been tested mainly through healthy volunteers. We don't have good data on how well it prevents smallpox because we don't have smallpox right now. And so a lot of our effectiveness data, the numbers you'll see quoted in the media are around 80, you know, 85%. That's really based on antibody data and some data that we have out of the previous outbreaks of monkeypox. So we can certainly say it's effective, but it's hard to give an exact number about how effective it is for this specific strain. I'm kind of disappointed at the fact that it is being portrayed as primarily an issue within the gay community, especially with gay men, and I don't really understand what has led to the messaging being that it is an STI, and why is it something that we are being sort of told to fear from gay men. So I think the first thing I'd say is that we don't need to be afraid, um, you know, but Part of the issue with the, the monkeypox being specifically within the commu queer community right now is one of bad luck. So there's been an outbreak that's been happening with monkeypox in parts of Africa for a long time. And then post COVID as travel opened up, the first ep episodes of disease that we saw amongst people outside of that area of the world were within gay men. And then primarily it's being passed from person to person within those sexual networks. Anybody can get monkeypox, it's spread through skin to skin contact, but it's just because it's emerged first in that community and that's where some of the epidemiology, epidemiology lies right now. So I think there's a good follow up to this one here. Can women get monkeypox? So definitely women can get monkeypox, anybody can get monkeypox. Again, this, this virus is spread by skin to skin contact. So um, there's, it's not like people are immune and that this is a male only disease. But right now, in terms of the infections we're seeing, they're almost exclusively within the LGBT community. And that's why we're really encouraging folks within that community to go out and get vaccinated. So it's really just kind of a matter of happenstance of where it's kind of getting passed around as opposed to who exactly. is. Exactly. This is, this is where, you know, it, when it comes within a particular community, this could have been easily women. It could have been easily, you know, children in daycares. It just, it happened to come out within the queer community. And those are the folks who tend to be affected. Um, and so that's the group that we're really trying to target now with vaccination. There's also been a bit of a disconnect between, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community and public health authorities. So, for example, they asked uh, gay and bisexual men to limit their sexual partners. What do you make of that advice? What's your practical advice? So, you know, I think my practical advice in, in that sort of a setting is really to, you know, think about what your level of risk is. So asking a bunch of, of people to limit their sexual partners to me, it just, 
it's not necessarily the best way to look at something like this in terms of preventing disease. I think the better thing to do is to think about going out and getting vaccinated. Um, you know, we live in a post-COVID world where the last two and a half years we've been inside a lot. And I think a lot of people are looking to go out and, and kind of enjoy themselves this summer. Um, and, you know, I will comment that this is another time when specifically people in the LGBT community are being singled out as, as you know, their natural human need for, for contact and sex is, is somehow wrong. So that's not my approach. What I talk about is really, you know, again, you can think about your sexual network and, and have frank conversations about, about folks about have they had their monkeypox vaccine? Do they have any symptoms? You know, really have that, that discussion with a potential sexual partner. Um, but I think just a blanket advice of don't have sex is a little, you know, it, it's just a little bit unrealistic. So to underscore the doctor's point, his biggest piece of advice for those who are concerned is to have open conversations with your partners about monkeypox and get the vaccine as soon as you're able. After the break, he was a renowned lawyer that took on some of Canada's biggest causes. The federal court of Canada has ordered the armed forces to cease discrimination against gays and lesbians. The life and legacy of civil rights advocate Clayton Ruby. But first, some concerning crashes in the nation's capital with one person in custody for mischief. A 29-year-old man was taken into custody after he crashed his vehicle into the front gates of Parliament Hill early this morning. He's been charged with dangerous operation of a motor vehicle and mischief. That investigation is ongoing. And bizarrely enough, another crash in Ottawa this morning. This one, an amphibious tour bus smashing into the fence at 24 Sussex Drive. The official residence of the Prime Minister, though currently unoccupied. The driver was the only person on board. The company says it's investigating. Well, tonight, many Canadians are mourning the death of the crusading criminal lawyer Clayton Ruby. He earned a reputation as a champion of the underdog and civil rights. His many honours, including the Order of Canada. Farah Morali shows us how his cases changed this country. The Federal Court of Canada has ordered the armed forces to cease discrimination against gays and lesbians. It was a case that changed the landscape of the Canadian military. In 1989, Michelle Douglas was dismissed from the Canadian Armed Forces for being gay. Just as her case was about to go to trial, the military abandoned its policies banning LGBT Canadians from serving. At the heart of that, Clayton Ruby. As a legal giant, I, I, I struggle to think of another lawyer in this country who contributed more than him. Ryan Schiller worked with Ruby for nearly 30 years and remembers his fearlessness. It was about ensuring that justice was done and that, he, that, that we work towards a greater equality in people. And Clay believed in that so strongly. One of Ruby's highest profile cases exposed the wrongful conviction of Guy Paul Morant, accused of raping and killing nine-year-old Christine Jessup. He was exonerated after 18 months in prison. There is no reason to suspect that this kid murdered her as opposed to anybody else in the universe. Part of Ruby's legacy, his impact on young lawyers like Gerald Chan. It really um, inspired a generation of lawyers, uh, and, and especially myself. Hey, Ruby, for me, will always be someone who, 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 who was transformational, who was a hero, who, who, who used the law in a way to, to, to fight for justice. In 1994, Ruby represented former NDP MP Sven Robinson, who was present at Sue Rodriguez's medically assisted death, a death which was unlawful at the time. I haven't seen his life in Canada before, and we, we've lost a, a truly great man in Canada today. More than anything, Schiller says he'll remember Ruby's empathy toward clients and everyone else. It's really a sad day. It's, it's hard to imagine a world without him. Clayton Ruby died on Tuesday. He was 80 years old. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, Miss Marvel wraps its first season, making history in the process. Have you ever wanted something so bad? And then it actually happens. We revisit our conversation with the MCU's first Muslim superhero.
Kamala getting her powers and me getting this part kind of go hand in hand. How a Canadian teen scored the role of a lifetime. That's after the break. Welcome back. It's been an unbelievable summer for Canadian actor Iman Vellani, or as you might know her better now, Ms. Marvel. With no acting credits to her name, Vellani went straight from high school to Marvel superhero in the Disney series that premiered in June. Back then, just before that big moment, we met up to talk about it all. Have you ever wanted something so bad? And then it actually happened. Well, that's exactly what happened to Mark Monterio's Iman Vellani. Landing the role of Kamala Khan, Marvel Studios' first ever Muslim superhero, was a dream come true for the 19-year-old comic book fangirl. I sat down with her this week ahead of her Toronto red carpet premiere. Congratulations, first of all, to you. Thank you. And, you know, it's so interesting because I understand your story kind of mirrors Kamala's yeah. a little bit, except for the superpowers part. No, I mean, Kamala getting her powers and me getting this part kind of go hand in hand, so. Do you even know what you are? I'm a superhero. Tell me a little bit about how you're feeling about the series finally, you know, debuting in just a couple days. It's weirdly a weight off my shoulders, but also more of a weight on them. But uh, no, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and, and to be, you know, screening it in Toronto. There you go, right here, I hear. It feels comfortable being back home and, and to talk to fellow Canadians and, and experience this with them. And there's such an incredible pride. And I feel that every time there's a new Canadian actor, actress in the Marvel or in the industry. And so it's just, it's nice to be one of them. Tell me a little bit more about the audition. And what do you think it was about you <laughs> that made them decide this is a girl with no experience who we're going to put as the, the lead of this? I've been asking myself the same question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I felt so close to home with this character and I had nothing to lose. So I really went all out. And my first screen test was just me absolutely fangirling over the Marvel producers. Anyone who had a Marvel logo on their jacket or on their baseball cap, I was there asking for, you know, telling, asking them to tell me stories from filming Endgame and working with Robert Downey Jr. specifically and, and all these amazing actors. And so I think they just saw the passion that I had and I got the part on the last day of high school, which was great. And getting that call, I saw that featurette where you're on the Zoom. It would be honored if you would play a Kamala Khan for us in the Miss Marvel show. And it was unanimous decision. Oh my God. <laughs> it's right now. I can't comprehend this right now. What was that like to, to officially get the news? So my friends were watching me from their car and I was on her driveway and they didn't know I had auditioned. And so Sarah Finn and Krista, our casting directors, text me, they're like, can you get on this call? And I'm like, no, I'm busy. And they were like, uh, get on, we just sent you the link, winky face. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I get out and it's Kevin Feige's face and I'm like trying not to have a reaction because my friends were watching. Um, that didn't work out. I was like fully freaking out in front of them and I get back in the car after everything's <laughs> over and I was, and they were like, so what, did you like win the lottery or something? And I was like, basically. And we, we got celebratory burritos. Maybe they're right. I spend too much time in fantasy land. That is not you. It's not really the brown girls from Jersey City who saved the world. This is the first Muslim superhero for Marvel. But not just that, you know, the story really kind of dives into what life is like for a Muslim American teen. It felt so authentic and without, you know, a, a, pandering without kind of, uh, you know, being patronizing. And in the first scene, your brother tells you to say Bismillah before yeah. your, your driver's test. Your mom says there's going to be too much haram at the party, right? So as a Muslim watching, it's nice to just hear those little things yeah. that you know, you're familiar with and you, you grew up with. How did you feel about how the Muslim American experience was kind of portrayed? And, and did you feel like this is really authentic? Because that's what struck me. Yeah, I mean, we have so many incredibly talented creatives who have such a deep connection to the source material. And our, our producer, Sana Manith, who also co-created the character, Miss Marvel, has been on top of everything. And so I, I very much trust them and, and, and trust that they're, you know, 
doing right by the character and they would also ask me a lot of the time to just kind of tell my experience of growing up and how I balanced religion and high school and everything and I'm like it's not a balance it's a part of my life like you know this is the time I wake up this is the time I go to school this is the time I pray this is the time I eat like it was just built in my schedule it's like an extracurricular you know it's be being Muslim wasn't my entire life and that's not Kamala's either you know she's she's at the heart of the character, she's a superhero fanatic who just happens to be Pakistani and Muslim, right? I think that's what real representation is, is kind of just getting to know a real person and a real character and making them as real and genuine and palpable as possible because as soon as you start generalizing Muslims, you're representing no one. There's two billion of them. Like, it's impossible. I know what it's like to be a first to represent a community, yeah. to be a first and an only, and that can also be a lot of pressure to feel like you have to do right by them. How do you deal with that? Well, being the first of anything is, is scary, but I don't, I don't take it to heart. I, I think the work is gonna speak for itself, and I really do think that we've done a good job, and I'm proud of it, and I think right down to the music, we've, we've really nailed the essence of, of the comics, and that's what was most important for me, to, to because those comics meant the world to me, and they really got me through high school, and, and you know, I just, I, I really hope that this show has the same effect on people that the comics did on me. I wish that you would just focus on your story. You're Kamala Khan. You want to save the world, then you're going to save the world. As you get ready to, you know, debut the, the first couple of episodes, people are going to get to meet you and meet Kamala. Um, what are you most excited for people to see? Ooh, I am excited for a lot of things. I'm excited for people to see children of immigrant parents who are proud of their culture because that was something that like really hit home for me. I was I felt very disconnected from being Pakistani and, and being Muslim growing up. Not to say my parents didn't try. They I grew up with all four of my grandparents, you know, they I watched all the Bollywood movies, but it didn't I didn't see the value of it or I didn't think it was cool and now working at Marvel and seeing you know, these creatives who are Muslim and Pakistani and or South Asian and they're so in touch with their culture made me really go back and, you know, reconnect with my roots. Yeah, we would cover a lot in the show and I just I hope people can take away something something good from it. This is one of you know many stories that Marvel and, and other, you know, uh, Hollywood uh, production houses have taken on in terms of, you know, quote unquote diverse right. stories. But I think it's kind of showing that these themes and these, you know, these stories are universal. Do you hope that this will bring more representation into Hollywood? Yeah, this is barely the beginning. Miss Marvel cannot be the last Muslim superhero or the last Muslim TV show or any of that. I, I just hope this inspires, you know, future generations of filmmakers and, and artists to kind of tell their stories because it's, it's important work. So great to chat with you. Congratulations Thank again. You. I, I'm, I'm so excited for everyone else Thank you. to meet Kamala, to meet you, Iman, and all, wishing you all the best. I think this is just the beginning of a, of a bright career for you. <laughs> Thank you. And while that is Iman Vellani's first acting credit, it's de definitely not her last. She's set to appear in the movie The Marvels to be released next year. Now, when we come back, getting the band back together again. <laughs> One of Canada's oldest community orchestras brings back summer concerts for the first time since the pandemic. That's the Oakville Wind Orchestra based in Oakville, Ontario. It's older than Confederation, but just by a year. And started in 1866 as a military band. Today, it's made up of citizen volunteers driven by a love of music and community. Now, they were silenced by the pandemic for two years. And tonight, their instrumental return is our moment. One, two, a one, two, three, four. This group has been running since 1866. This band has been through two world wars and now two pandemics. And they sound better than they ever have. They play French horn with the Oakville Wind Orchestra. During COVID, I think something that a lot of us found was missing was that spirit of community and that coming together. And music lets us do that in a way like no other art form really can. It's so 
nice to play with everybody else and being in the harmony together. Everybody in the band is giving something personal to make something beautiful for the people who are listening. I thought they were fantastic. I love their songs. It was fun to be here and listen to music with everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, the Oakville Wind Orchestra. Fantastic. You heard the conductor there mention two pandemics. The other one was the 1918 Spanish flu. Now, as their name suggests, they play in Oakville, Ontario. Only a couple days to catch their last final show. That's Tuesday, August 9th. They also play Valentine's Day and Christmas concerts. Of course, those are during the winter season, so those are indoors. That's it for us here on The National for this August 3rd. Have a good night.